So in the last video, we had made this prediction for the frequencies of a simple wind instrument. So we, I have a one meter long tube and we understood that standing waves in this tube, um, if I play it like covering up one end, these should have a node at one end. So the end where my mouth would be and then an anti-node at the other end to make a lot of noise. So the air goes in and out quite a bit. And we understood that there were various possibilities for what the displacement inside the tube could look like. So the simplest one, you just have a node at one end, an anti-node at the other end, but you could also have some nodes in the middle, one node or two nodes or three nodes or so forth. And each of those corresponds to a different wavelength. So even though our tube is one meter long, that tube can support standing waves with a whole series of possible wavelengths. So the wavelength for the first one is four meters because you have exactly one quarter of a wave that fits inside the tube. And then the wavelength for the second one is four thirds of a meter because you have exactly three quarters of a wavelength that fits in the tube and so forth. So we get wavelengths, which are four meters divided by the various odd numbers, four meters, four meters over three, four meters over five and so forth. And finally, then we used the basic relation between wavelength, frequency and wave speed to predict the various frequencies. And in this case, the wave speed is the speed of sound because it's what's that's what the air is, sorry, what the wave is propagating in. So these are hollow tube, this is a hollow tube. And so the, the wave is just a regular sound wave in air inside the tube. So we use 340 meters per second for that. And then we go ahead and do these calculations to find the various frequencies. So frequency of the first one, 340 meters per second divided by four, and then divided by uh, four thirds, and then divided by four fifths. And those all work out to this series, which is a little bit different than the series that we found for the string. So we find a fundamental frequency of 85 Hertz. And then the next one is actually three times that. And the next one is five times the fundamental. So for the tube with one end closed, you end up getting just the odd harmonics, the first one and the third one and the fifth one. So I want to now demonstrate that. I want to try to actually play this tube in various ways to see whether those are the frequencies that we can produce. And so the simplest thing I'm going to do is actually originally not play it like a trumpet, but rather just uh, just go ahead. I'm just going to tap on the end of it. Um, so this is something that I can do. And I'm, I'm sort of putting that up to the microphone. OK, so you can hear a note there. And I mean, this is like the equivalent of plucking a string or, or hitting a string with a hammer. Uh, I'm not driving it with any particular frequency. It's just basically doing something to get the air inside there oscillating. And so what we expect is when I do that, I should get a combination of all of the possible different harmonics that my sound, that this sound that we're hearing should be a combination of the pure tones with these frequencies that we've just predicted. 85, 255, 425, and then 595 would be the next one. So I want to do that in uh, a demonstration here. So let's actually have a look at what these frequencies are by recording our sound in Audacity. Let's do that a little louder. OK, so we got a couple of good ones there. Um, let's let's have a look at this one. And if we just zoom in there, okay, so we see we get a, a kind of um, repeating pattern, although it, the, the amplitude is decreasing fairly quickly because the, the note is very short. But nevertheless, we can go ahead and plot the spectrum of that. And let me just correct this one. Um, so we get 
actually quite okay so we actually get all these harmonics um, this is the logarithmic plot so they don't look equally spaced but that's because the frequencies are not plotted in an equally spaced way but we can see what the frequencies are um, and so looking at down here it shows you the the peak of each one and so this one is 86 hertz so that's actually just uh, one hertz off what our prediction was and then this next one uh, 253 hertz it says and so remember we predicted 255 hertz for the next harmonic and then we get um, in this this one is uh, it says 431 so that's again very close to our prediction of 425 and 596 is almost bang on to the prediction for the next one um, which would be 595. I just want to show you that the linear scale uh, for this so that that compresses everything down uh, but I can stretch it out okay so now this is this is where the frequencies are plotted equally spaced on the horizontal axis and so then you can see that there there's basically an equal spacing between these various peaks um, but the th the second peak is not double the frequency, it's actually three times. And the third peak is five times the frequency. Okay, so this is just what we expected based on our predictions. Okay, but that sound wasn't very impressive. Um, so what I want to do is now actually play this in the way that you would play a trumpet. So I could just blow on the end, um, but instead it'll be convenient for me to actually use a trumpet mouthpiece. So let's have a look at what that sounds like. So we have a one meter long tube and we've calculated the various frequencies that standing waves inside that tube should be at. And so now I'm going to try to play those various notes um, on the tube. And I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna play it like a trumpet. Um, and so I could just put my mouth on the end, but it's a little bit more comfortable to actually use a trumpet mouthpiece. So I'm just gonna stick that into the tube and then that will make it easier for me to play. So our, our lowest frequency is actually the hardest one for me to play. Uh, so we'll give it a shot. Let me let me play how it sounds first. So here it is, 85 hertz. Okay, now I'll try to play that. All right, so that was, it took me a while to, to actually be able to do that. You really have to relax your lips. Um, next one was, um, 200 three times that so 255 hertz there we go The next one was five times 85, so 425 hertz. And let's see if we can even get the next one. So that would be seven times 85, so uh, 595 hertz would be the next one that's supposed to be playable. sure an actual brass player could do that much better than I could um, but yeah it really seems like those 
notes we calculate are exactly the ones that are coming out. And I can't... Okay. So, always nice when something works. I just wanted to quickly show you uh, if, you know, that, that trumpet mouthpiece was just a little bit more comfortable. This hole was very small, um, so it was hard for me to fit my lips into there to, to make it make uh, the vibrations. But um, if, if I use a slightly bigger one meter tube, then I can still play that in the same way. Okay, so it's, you don't need anything fancy. It's literally just a tube. I went to the hardware store and got some PVC pipe and cut it to one meter and I can play that as a musical instrument. So, you know, what if we want other notes? We showed that we could play these specific notes, 85 hertz, 255 hertz, 425 hertz on a tube with a length of one meter. What if you wanted um, a higher note or a lower note? Because we don't just play those notes in a piece of music, we want to play lots of different kinds of notes. And so basically the idea is, well, you could just have tubes of different lengths. So by varying the length of the tube, um, you could play different notes and each length would give you access to this fundamental and some of the harmonics. But then if you, if you were able to have different lengths, then you would be able to play more notes and so that's basically how all of your wind instruments work. So just before we get into start talking about some examples, um, I want you to just think to yourself, what would we have to do to the length of the tube if we wanted a lower note? And don't just think of the answer, think of an argument for the answer based on some of the physics that we've talked about. Okay, so specifically think about this formula that the frequency and the wavelength are related by this equation. Okay, so I think intuitively may, many of you probably know that you want a longer tube to get a lower note. Uh, large instruments often play lower notes than small instruments. But let's understand how that follows from this equation. And so the idea is, number one, the lower note corresponds to a lower frequency. So F is going to be smaller. And so because the speed of sound in air doesn't change, it's just the same thing whether we're playing a low note or a high note. For this to be true, then what we need if the frequency is lower, then we want the wavelength to be larger. And if you think about it, the wavelength is directly related to the length of the tube. So for the lowest note you can play on the tube, then the wavelength was just four times that amount. So if I want this wavelength for my lowest note to be longer, then I just need to make a longer tube. Okay. And so that's basically how things work. And so now we can talk about different examples of wind instruments and how they manage to achieve these differing tube lengths. And so the simplest idea is that you just literally have a whole bunch of tubes of different lengths. So that's what a pipe organ does. Basically just plays the fundamental for each of those tubes and it has one tube for every different frequency that it wants to produce. Okay, so that's a that's a very simple kind of idea to be able to play all of the usual notes in in say this the chromatic scale that we'll talk about later on. Uh, you just have one tube for every note. Another instrument that does something similar is a pan flute, where again, you just have a whole bunch of different tubes and you play 
on those different tubes to generate the different notes. I actually have a really simple, a really small one here that has five tubes of different lengths where we can play five different notes. I think on the pan flute, sometimes you play the fundamental and possibly a harmonic above the fundamental. So you can get more than one note on the individual pipes. On this one, I could just play the fundamental barely. Um, but what about other instruments? Um, so we're going to talk about examples where you only have one tube and still you can play lots of different notes. Okay, but before we do that, I wanted to go through an example of a quantitative version of our last question. So last time we said, if you wanted a lower note, you have to have a longer tube. In this question, I want you to predict how long the tube should be if instead of 85 hertz, which is the fundamental on a one meter long tube, if instead of 85 hertz, you want to play 595 hertz. So how long should your tube be in that case? Take a minute to work it out for yourself. Again, we can make use of this basic relation between wavelength and frequency. And in a minute, I'll discuss the method to do that. Okay, so let's talk through this. So it turns out that the easiest way to do this is just to look at how does the frequency change? So we want to see how does the frequency change going from 85 to 595 hertz, and then understand how, what has to happen to the wavelength in order to compensate for that, because the speed of sound is not changing when we change the different note. Okay, so let's go through that in detail. What we notice is that 595 hertz that is some multiple of 85 hertz that we can work out. So let's let's actually do that here. Um, so we first observe that um, 595 divided by 85 turns out to be seven. Okay, so 595 hertz is a frequency that's seven times higher than 85 hertz. And so that means that in order to play that frequency, well, we need a, a shorter tube. And what we need is that the wavelength is seven times smaller. So we need the wavelength to be seven times smaller in order that the wavelength times the frequency is still equal to the same speed of sound, sound that it was before. And remember that the wavelength is just directly controlled by the length of the tube. And so if we want a wavelength, a fundamental wavelength that's seven times smaller, then we need a tube that's seven times shorter. Okay, and here I'm using that the lambda was just for the fundamental that's equal to four times the length. That's what we worked out before. Okay, so to get a frequency seven times higher, we need a wavelength that's seven times smaller, and that will be produced by a tube that's seven times shorter. So the tube length that we need is one meter divided by seven, and that works out to 0 0.14 meters. Okay, so so 14 centimeters. Okay, and so turns out uh, we can we can test this because I have this little pan flute here, and it turns out that the longest hole. So so this is this is a tube on the pan flute. It turns out the longest tube on that pan flute is just right around 14 centimeters, and so we can check that, so I'll, I'll play the note. Not very good at this, but. So I'm more or less just disturbing the air on top of the tube so that it gets the air inside the tube vibrating and then it naturally wants to vibrate at this, at this um, fundamental frequency. Um, so let's just check if that's close to 595 hertz. Uh, let me go back to 
audacity here and um, we'll, re we'll make a new new recording okay here we go there we go and then we'll just check the frequency on that so analyze plot spectrum um, and so yeah it's mostly this this uh, fundamental frequency and there we go so it says 589 Hertz so that's very close to what we predicted my tube is definitely not exactly 14 centimeters long but it was pretty close and so we're getting a frequency um, almost exactly the same as the one that we hoped for so what about other wind instruments that don't have a whole bunch of tubes um, how do they manage to play lots of different notes and not just this harmonic series? So maybe think about a couple of examples on your own. And then I'm gonna talk about several different kinds of wind, wind instruments and how they are able to achieve uh, getting different tube lengths. Okay, so let's start with a really simple one, which is the trombone. And so in the trombone, you have this single tube going from the mouthpiece uh, to this other end, which we call the bell of the trombone. Um, it's not actually, um, as you can see, it's not a fixed thickness of tube. Um, so, so that bell does have an important effect on the sound, but let's not worry about that yet. So with a trombone, you can slide this part of the tube in and out to effectively make a longer or a shorter tube. Okay, so here's the shortest position, and then you, you just slide it out, and here's the longest position that you would have. And then in order to play various notes on a trombone, uh, you would just use one of these positions and then play one, either the fundamental frequency or uh, one of the harmonics. And so by that method, you can actually play sort of all of the regular notes um, in, in the musical chromatic scale. Okay. Uh, of course, an interesting thing about a trombone is you could play the notes in between these notes as well. You can make your tube length, you could vary it continuously. And so you can really get almost any possible frequency um, within, uh, with, you know, above this lowest frequency that correspond to the fundamental in this longest uh, length situation. Uh, another example is the trumpet. I uh, have a trumpet, happen to have that sitting here. Uh, so let's actually, let's just look at the actual trumpet um, instead. There we go. Um, so a trumpet also just changes the length of the tube in a different way where you press down on these, on these valves. And so what happens is that if I press this one, then, so, you know, usually the tube is, is just going around here and, and then out to the bell. Uh, but if I press this valve, then what happens is it adds on this little length of tube. So now the air goes through this part of the tube as well. And if I press this valve, then that adds on uh, sort of this length of tube here on the other side, which is, which is longer. And if I press uh, this valve here, then that adds on this length of tube. Okay, so basically the more valves I press, um, just adds on different extra lengths of tubes. And so like the trombone, there's a bunch of different lengths you can have. Here it's a specific discrete set of lengths. So just to demonstrate that, and, and sorry, I'm not a, a trumpet player, but um, I'll play a note and then I'll play this middle one that adds on a little bit of tube. And then I'll play this one, which adds on more, and this that adds on more. And so we should hear three different notes, each one lower than the last one, if I stick with the same harmonic. <laughs> So that actually worked. I think that might have been some of my best trumpet playing ever. Um, and if I press more than one of those notes, you, you can get even lower uh, notes. 
All right, so back to our slides here. The other kind of instrument uh, or the other method that you will see for making the tube longer or shorter is the instruments that actually have holes on the tube. And so this is kind of interesting, the way it works, uh, is just that when I cover up a certain number of holes, then, so let, let's look at the picture first and then I'll demonstrate it. So when you cover up some of the holes, um, the first open hole actually effectively acts as the end of the tube. So if this hole is open, then it doesn't really, like the rest of this tube down here does not matter. The, the air is oscillating here at, in and out in this hole. And that's basically the place where you're producing most of the sound. It doesn't really matter if you have the rest of the tube. Once you get to that first open hole, that's effectively the end. Okay, and so with a simple instrument like a recorder, you just place your fingers on the holes to open them and close them. Um, with a clarinet, it's a combination of sometimes just placing your fingers on the holes and sometimes using these buttons on the clarinet to open and close other holes. Um, with a saxophone, it's a little bit, it's just always pressing different buttons to open and close holes on the instrument, but it's all the same idea, just making the tube shorter and longer. Um, so yeah, let me just, let me demonstrate that here directly. So, uh, so I've got the recorder, right? So just to, and of course you've, you've seen this before, but so the lowest note, I cover up all the holes and then as, as I uncover them, the note gets higher and higher. Um, I can also play harmonics, so if they're all closed, I can play uh, that fundamental tone or higher harmonics. And so that way I can play, uh, I can play various notes even at a fixed tube length. Okay, uh, finally, I just wanted to, just to, again, drive that home that, that when I have some open holes, so if, if I play this note on a clarinet, then the first open hole is right here, and that's effectively how long the tube is. So it really doesn't matter that you have all of the rest of this down at the bottom. Um, so let me do a, a demonstration. I'm gonna play some stuff up at the top without using my right hand. All right. And so if what I said is right, I should be able to just get rid of the whole lower half of the instrument and play the same thing. That was uh, etude for half a clarinet. And so, so you see that uh, when I'm playing up, up in the higher notes where there's a lot of open holes down in the lower end of the instrument, uh, the lower end of the instrument doesn't really need to be there at all. It doesn't, it basically doesn't do anything. All right, and so just uh, finally here, uh, just to kind of consolidate everything we've been talking about, I uh, have a quick question for you. So the overall size of a wind instrument, which property does that most directly affect? And so take a minute to choose one of these answers, commit, see if you have an argument for it in your mind. And so basically the answer here is that the overall size of a wind instrument most directly affects the lowest note it is able to play. So when I cover up all of the holes on a wind instrument with, with holes, um, or, or in the, the trumpet or trombone case, I just try to play the, the lowest harmonic that I can, um, then the frequency is just determined by the total length of the instrument. 
And so that's why when you have families of instruments, like thinking about the brass instruments or saxophones, or here, here's a bunch of different kinds of recorders, uh, the lower sounding ones are the larger ones. So with an alto saxophone, if you cover up all of the holes, then there's a certain note that you can play, which, which is going to be like the fundamental frequency for that length of tube. Um, and in order to play anything lower than that, you, need, you just need a bigger instrument. Okay, so here is a tenor saxophone, it's bigger, baritone saxophone, it's bigger, a bass, and I think this one's called a contrabass uh, saxophone. You almost never see those. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, next time we'll talk about, there's, there's one other way, um, one other thing that can affect the frequency of a wind instrument. And so we'll talk about that the next time.